Really appreciate you sticking around. I think uh, all of you recognize we kept the uh, not the best for last, okay? Because obviously we provided everybody was was uh, great presenters and the information presented. But we did bring to you, hopefully, uh, through a lot of hard work on behalf of Linda Gonzalez, who worked with Federico and his staff to convince him. Would you please consider, okay? Uh, this opportunity. So uh, we're really great to, to have uh, Federico Pena with us. You know, I have his um, his bio, but how, how do I how do I even introduce Federico? Okay, you all know who Federico Pena is. Okay, but um, but it's honored. We're it's, we're, it's extreme honor, extreme honor uh, to have uh, uh, the Secretary Mayor. Um, Federico Pena here with us today to um, to discuss the discussions that we've had, um, and I briefed him briefly on what we have been discussing, and uh, I also sh shared with him a story um, that he told a story to the Pueblo Chamber of Commerce um, about 30 years ago, I guess. Okay, um, and I reminded him of the story, and it's a joke. And he says, I can't believe I told that story. <laughs> maybe, maybe you'll tell it again. I don't know. So. <laughs> anyway, um, and, and he said, I'm surprised you even remembered it. And I said, well, that's exactly why I remembered it. But anyway, uh, I, I, I do um, uh, respect the, uh, the opportunity of you all reading his bio. Uh, I think it goes without saying you all know who uh, who's, uh, who uh, Secretary Pena is and what he has done and what he's accomplished, and he's made us all proud. He's made us all proud. Not only <laughs> so. With that, I'm going to turn it right over to uh, uh, Secretary Pena. Thank you. When, when did you want to give the, uh, the donation? Okay, so right after your presentation. Okay, great. Great, good. All right, we're doing a little administrative work here. Thank you very much. Uh, should I call you Mr. City Manager? Does that sound better? Or should I call him Jefe? Jefe, Capitan, General, whatever the term is. Um, Manuel, thank you very much for the introduction. By the way, can you all hear? I also have a lavalier on my... Coat, thank you. <laughs> so I hope that doesn't re reverberate throughout the room. But uh, let me first thank uh, Manuel for that very kind introduction because your introduction was the most effective introduction of all. Because in other circumstances, somebody would have started by explaining what I did in third grade <clears throat> and then working up to fifth grade and high school and all that. And I'm glad you jumped over all that. But Thank you very much for the introduction, and thank you for your hospitality. And to wonderful Linda, let's give her a, wonder, a round of applause. Uh, I have never met Linda, right, Linda? This is the first time we've met, but she contacted me two, three months ago, yeah. at least. And, and I want to say this very honestly, not because she's here, but I would say it anyway. The way in which she approached uh, my office and my team was so professional. And everyone's very impressed. And at the end of the day, they said, you've got to go give this speech <laughs> just for Linda, you know? So Linda, thank you very much for being uh, persistent and, and offering me the opportunity to come here. So thank you again. I, I have to also say that driving up here today from Denver with the beautiful weather, you know, the sun was out and gorgeous um, weather, I, I was reminded at what an extraordinary community Brighton has been for so long, and Adams County is. And then when I got here, and I ran into Dave Rose, <laughs> old friends, uh, and others, I won't name all of you, I don't want to embarrass you, there are a number of elected officials here, members of city council, and, and now people in the county government, and, and others who were involved in various things. I was reminded, particularly when one of your guests said, when I was six years old, my mother dragged me out to campaign for you door to door, and, <laughs> and she lived in Adams County. But I was reminded about how much people in Adams County supported me uh, when I was 35 years old. 
when I announced my candidacy for mayor uh, at a time, and I'll talk about this later, but I want to mention it now, at a time when people said, Federico who? Because <laughs> they didn't know who I was. I had no name recognition. But people in Adams County believed, and people in Pueblo believed, and people around the state, and the San Luis Valley, and the Arkansas Valley, and the Western Slope, they all came to Denver and helped me campaign. And, and that's something that I will for, forever be indebted to so many of you and, and people around the state for believing in me and helping me do whatever I've done in my life. So thank you all very much. And it's great to be with you again and great to be with so many friends. And thank you for the, taking the time to be here for the second annual IHN uh, conference. <clears throat> now, I know a little bit about the organization uh, because I read your goals and objectives, which are to support Latino local government officials, helping to better serve the Latino community, improving professionalism throughout the ranks, developing new talent. And as I reflected on those four general goals, I, I said to myself, this is exactly what is needed in our nation today. Uh, this focus on local elected officials, local um, government officials, doing things in a professional way, developing talent, developing diversity, and I'm going to talk about that. And why do I say that? Because sometimes we forget, you know, I went to Washington and it's very far away and, you know, we're dealing with worldly things. I went to 35 countries and traveled all over the United States. But I've always remembered that it is at the local level where if you're in government, either as an elected official or as an executive or a city manager or an assistant city, whatever it is, this is where you touch people's lives every day. You were telling me the story about your mom who used to live in Sloan Lake. And when I was mayor, apparently we put in a street light for your mom, and she never forgot that. That perhaps was one of the most important things to give her some safety and security in that part of the city. But what you do as local officials impacts people's lives daily and more dramatically than anything anybody can do in Washington, believe it or not. Think about that. Or anything anybody can do in, in the state capitol. And why is that? Because when people work through their lives every day and they're struggling, right? Two jobs, trying to get their kids through high school, maybe into college, uh, worrying about health care, all the kinds of things they worry about, you know, safety in their neighborhoods. Who is it that impacts them the most? It's the local officials. And unless you as local officials understand your customers, your constituents, apparently I did, <laughs> you are either rewarded for that and you form a bond with those people that you're trying to serve, or you don't. And that's why I think what you're doing as an organ international organization is so important. So, so thank you for, for doing that. Now, is something rattling up here? The mics are kissing. That happens to me a lot, by the way. Por favor, portense bien. I don't want to have to give you guys a regañada later on. I'll translate that later. Um, in coming today, uh, Linda made me do some homework, but that's the way she is. I'm glad you did. And she said, I'd like for you to talk about four things. First of all, talk a little bit about yourself, my journey, some of the challenges and obstacles and surmounting those obstacles in my own life. I will do that very briefly. Believe me, I'm not here to talk about myself. Uh, and on that note, I'm actually, Dave, finally writing my autobiography. I've been working on it for two years. And uh, it's not that exciting, <laughs> but it's fresh on my mind. So I could speak for two hours about my life, so I'm not. Stop me if I go on too long. But I'm going to talk about that. But secondly, she asked me to talk a bit about developing a diverse workforce. I know your panelists this morning talked about that. You went into great detail. Thank you for doing that. I hope not to repeat what you said. But I'll give you my perspective, perhaps from a little more macro, uh, you know, eagle's perspective. Um, thirdly, Talk about the role of the employee and the public sector generally in addressing diversity of people, ideas, and approaches. So I'll really try to focus on that. But most importantly, I want to answer your questions. So please, Linda, throw something at me if I speak more than 25 minutes, because I want to give people a chance to ask questions, because that's really what I enjoy the most. So let's hope we can get that done. My journey. Um, you, you read the bio, so some of you know that I'm from Texas. Any, any Tejanos here? 
One, two, three, four. There's always somebody from Texas, such a big state. Um, little town called Brownsville, Texas. The Rio Grande, the Rio Grande, starts in Colorado, right? Flows through Albuquerque, goes through El Paso, goes down the border between Texas and Mexico. And where does it empty? Brownsville. <laughs> so we used to drink all the water <laughs> that you all dump things into. Uh, it was always funny because you pick up a glass of water and there's stuff in it. And people always wonder why we drank it, but that's why I have no cavities. <laughs> uh, a lot of chlorination. So I was raised in a small town of 30,000 people, 90% Hispanic. Everybody spoke English and Spanish. Our motto was by, on the border by the sea. Because we were literally, I could walk three miles and go into Matamoros, cross the border bridge, and I was into Mexico. My dad worked for a Mexican company, so everybody spoke English and Spanish. We, all, we interacted. We were always going to and from both countries. And of course, we had Padre Island and the beach and all that. And as a young man, um, in a family of six, in a community that was Hispanic, and Cameron County, where I was raised, was at one time the second or third or fourth poorest county in America on a per capita basis. I'm not crying about that. I'm just trying to describe the situation. So I went to high school there, and then I thought I wanted to become the first lawyer in my entire extended family. And I had an extended family of several hundred, from Laredo to Brownsville to McAllen to San Antonio, all over South Texas. And that was my dream. So I went to undergraduate school at the University of Texas, or as we used to say back then, the university. And when I went to Texas, the student body was larger than my hometown. I think it was 30, 40,000 people. So I, I, I went to the University of Texas. And back then, the University of Texas had a minority enrollment of 0.5 of 1%. <laughs> so there were not very many people like me. You could count Latinos probably on two or three hands. And I remember walking through that campus for days. And I would walk through the campus and not Nobody would say hello to me. Of course, I didn't know anybody, but it was, I'd never had that experience before. But I got through it one way or another with hard work and determination. And I'll talk about that in a little while. But then my dream finally came to a realization, that is to go to law school. And so I submitted my law school application. I took the LSAT test, which is the standardized test you have to take before you go to law school. I want to make a confession to all of you today. I am one of the poorest test takers in America. Whenever I take a standardized achievement test, I do very poorly. And of course, I met my standard when I took the LSAT test. I bombed it. It was terrible. And so I submitted all that to the law school. The dean said, colloquially, no way, Jose. No, he didn't say that. He did not say that. How's my humor? Is it better than in Pueblo? Is my jokes coming back a little? But, but, but <laughs> I won't tell the other joke. But the bottom line was, he says, you can't come into the law school because you have average grades. Your LSA too, is too, too low. And we predict that you will not pass the rigorous law school curriculum. And, and if you do, you won't pass the bar exam. And so we're, you're wasting a seat when we could be using it for somebody else who has a greater opportunity. And I kept going back to the dean week after week and saying, look, I want to be the first lawyer in my family. I'm going to work hard. I promise you I'll do the very best I can. And finally, probably a couple of weeks before they closed the last entrance group, they admitted me. Ah, I got in through sheer persistence and determination. And I'm sure when they admitted me, they were probably going, oh, gosh, you know, what did we do? Well, I got through law school fine, and I passed the bar exam. Then I moved to Colorado. I did some civil rights work in Texas, moved to Colorado, passed the bar exam here, et cetera. Irony of ironies, when I was uh, appointed to be Secretary of Transportation in Washington, DC, the University of Texas invited me back to Texas, asked me to give the commencement address to the law school. <laughs> <laughs> I was made. Life has all these ironies, right? And then I gave the commencement address to the university, and the university made me a distinguished alumni for the University of Texas. So life is strange about that. But uh, one little asterisk there. If you know anybody who is a poor test taker, remind them of my story. Do not be distracted or dismayed by poor test scores on these standardized achievement tests. They do not adequately value who you are. So you got to just move past those. At any rate, I came to Colorado. I was a civil rights lawyer. 
uh, got through law school, got through all those bar exams, all that, and then someone suggested I run for the state legislature. I said, why me? They said, well, you did some lobbying in the legislature. You're a lawyer. You're smart. You could probably do a good job. Uh, there's an open seat in Northwest Denver. Why don't you run there? I said, I don't even live in Northwest Denver. <laughs> so I had to move there. There was somebody who had been expected to run and win that seat, been in the community for 20 years. And I simply went door to door for five months. And I lost 10 pounds. I did. And I outworked my opponent. And I won the election. And people were surprised. How could this young, back then, 28, 29-year-old kid from Texas who didn't know anybody come to Colorado and run in the legislative seat and defeat somebody who'd been there for 20 years? I basically outworked the person. The other person took it for granted. And then I served in the legislature. And after my first term, the Democrats, I was a Democrat, came to me and said, we want you to be our leader. And I said, why me? Well, they elected me minority leader of the House and all that. And we did as well as we could as being the minority party. And then friends of mine came to me and said, why don't you run for mayor of Denver? I said, why should I do that? That's crazy. Back then, for those of you who were not here, in 1982, Bill McNichols was the mayor. He'd been mayor for 16 years, I think. His brother had been governor of Colorado. <laughs> Remember Governor McNichols? His father had been city auditor for 20 years. How could I run against a dynasty? Little old me against the dynastic term of the McNichols era or decades. Uh, but I decided to go ahead and run, work very hard. I announced my campaign in December of 1982, and the first thing the newspaper said was, Federico who? <laughs> Nobody knew who I was. But I worked hard, and people came out to me who were very well-intentioned and said, Federico, listen, you're a good guy. We love you. Why don't you stay in the state legislature? You don't have a chance to win as mayor of Denver. And frankly, Denver's not ready for a Hispanic mayor. Maybe in the year 2000. You know, That's what people said. That's what they felt, and they believed it. And these are my friends. And I listened to them, and I said, you know, I, I think I can do this. And I'm hearing rumblings in the community, and I'm sort of understanding people in Sloan Lake or wherever. And so I ran, and I won. And then things happened, uh, and I want to talk a little about that. But the most important thing I want to say about that, because I don't want to really talk much more about myself, is that having confidence and determination in your lives will help you overcome almost any obstacle. And part of that has to do with who you are as a person. And so going back to that little town in Brownsville, Texas, I had two wonderful parents who taught me to be proud of my identity, who taught me to be proud of my ancestry, who taught me to be proud of my culture and my language, and never to be overcome by others who perhaps did not appreciate that. And I think if you as an individual have self-confidence in yourself, because you know who you are, you know where you came from. My family in South Texas had been in South Texas for over 250 years. We were not immigrants. One of my ancestors founded Laredo, Texas 250 years ago on behalf of Spain, before Texas was a state, before the United States was a country in that sense, almost. I had ancestors who fought in the Civil War defending the South, defending the cotton in Laredo. So all of that I understood about myself. And I've come to conclude that if each of us as individuals understand our raices, our beginnings, our history, our families, you will be grounded in yourself. And that gives you a sense of confidence and identity that you belong. You belong. I've never felt in my life that I did not belong. I'm part of the land. My family is part of the land for generations. And so that helped me, I think, in addition to what my parents taught me, to do the things that I've done in my life. When I was mayor, I decided that I needed to have a diverse cabinet. My predecessor had one ethnic minority member of his administration. I completely transformed that. At least half of my entire administrative team of almost 50, 60 people, I'm forgetting how many people I appointed back then, were ethnic, racial minorities, women, um, people from the gay community. And the community wasn't ready for that. I got criticized. People said, what are you doing? You can't all of a sudden transform city government into something that we've never seen before. And by the way, half these people you appointed are going to fail. We don't have confidence in them. We don't know much about them. And I said two things. 
One, if I'm going to be mayor of a diverse community, my administration is going to reflect the diversity of the community from every walk of life. And number two, I said, to be successful, you have to surround yourself with diverse ideas and diverse people in order to address complex issues. You can't do it by yourself. I had a certain perspective coming from South Texas and my life, but it's very narrow. So I needed people who had other perspectives, who could bring me different ideas, different suggestions, a different way of looking at life, which made my team more powerful. Dave asked me to talk, I think you asked me to talk about the airport a little bit, which I will. So here it is, 1983. I've been elected mayor. I took office June, July 1st, 1983. I'm 37, whatever the age was, a young guy. And Dr. Cog, the Denver Regional Council of Governments, had been studying the airport site for years and years and years. They finally voted three weeks into my term. I was three weeks old as a mayor. <laughs> and they voted two to one to build the airport on the Rocky Mountain Arsenal. And I'm sitting in this meeting, and there are the two mayors, from, one from Adams County, Brighton and, and Commerce City, the three county commissioners, and they said, we do not like this. This is the wrong idea. You cannot build the airport on the Rocky Mountain Arsenal. And I'm going, why? It's just an extension of Stapleton. It's going to be close to your communities. What's the problem? I didn't understand. Went back to the office. My diverse team came together and said, wait a minute. Let's look at this problem differently. And people started asking different questions, all of which caused me to say, maybe I ought to sit down with the Adams County delegation and find out what's really on their minds. Not in public view in front of newspapers and reporters, but quietly, person to person. Let me step in your shoes, but you have to step in my shoes. So I picked up the phone, and I called one of the Adams County commissioners. I forget who it was at that time. And I said, let's sit down and talk about this, and I'm going to come to you. So you know what we ate? We had dinner at Bubba's Restaurant. <laughs> Anybody remember Bubba's Restaurant? We had dinner at Bubba's Restaurant. I came up with one aide. The three county commissioners were there. Two mayors were there. No mayor of Denver had ever done that. Because in the old days, mayors of Denver said, you come to Denver, and you meet me in my, on my home turf. But because of diverse, different kinds of thinking, we said, wait a minute, what's so sacrosanct about that? Let's go to them. Let's understand what they're thinking. Out of that dinner came the whole idea of finally listening and moving the airport to where it is today. And of course, we went through long negotiations that you were involved in, Mayor to finally get the deal done. And I think it's been a benefit to the entire metropolitan community. Out of diverse thinking, out of critical reviewing of your biases and your opinions so that you could look at the world differently. And what we did, we said, let's look at the world like this. Not like this. Not worrying about, am I getting this and am I getting that and this, this city, no. The idea was how can we do this in a way that everybody benefits over the next 50 years? Having a long-term vision for the broader metropolitan community. And that's what allowed that project to go on. I went to Washington, D.C. as a cabinet member, uh, ran the Department of Transportation for four years, the Department of Energy for a year and a half. Uh, a little unusual for someone of my background to run those two departments because typically ethnic minorities don't run those departments, and, and so I was very blessed to do that. But President Clinton believed that his cabinet should also be diverse, and he was criticized. You may remember those newspaper articles. They made fun of me, and they made fun of the women. And they made fun of the African Americans and the, everybody. It says this, the president's more concerned about diversity than actually having good people. And why did the media say that? And why did some public officials say that about all of us? Well, I'll tell you why. They had never met us. They didn't know me. All they knew was I was this guy from somewhere in Colorado and coming to the big city of Washington, D.C. And how on earth? Could I run a $35 billion Department of Transportation? Bye. I did that job. Did the same thing in energy. The president, I think, did a wonderful thing when he said, I want my cabinet to represent the United States. And I believe that these people can compete and perform as well as anybody else. Were there failures? Absolutely. Did some of our team members not perform? Absolutely. But so did the Anglo members of the team not perform, too. 
And what happens lots of times is when you're in my position or somebody else's position and you don't do well or you make a mistake, it's wow, what a failure. But when somebody else does it from a different ethnic or racial background, it's, well, not as much as said. But the point is, I took chances in putting my diverse team together, so did President Clinton do it. And since then, no one has ever asked the question again. No mayor of Denver has ever asked the question, and people don't ask anymore whether it should, there should be a diverse cabinet. No one ever questions whether there should be a diverse cabinet in Washington, D.C. Whether you're a Republican president or a Democratic president, it is simply done. Because we now know that there are highly competent people from every walk of life, and you can't judge anybody from the color of their skin or their sex or whatever. You have to understand them, and everybody is able to perform based on their own ability and their own resources. So I've always believed in that. I've always believed it's crucial. I can talk more about that, but I'm not. I simply want to end that discussion by simply saying that in public life, diverse teams bring great ideas, superior people, and as an entity, entities can maximize their energy and their ability to perform by having a diverse team. And we've seen it happen for many, many decades now. Shifting to the more specific conversation you wanted me to talk about, Linda, um, developing a workforce of tomorrow. How do you position your organization? You all talked about this this morning. I'm going to approach it a little differently, I think. I serve on three corporate boards. Two, uh, they're all publicly traded. One of them is a diversity board, the other two are public. And when you sit on a corporate board these days in America, corporations are now, the smart corporations are now saying this. We must have a diverse workforce, we must have a diverse management team, and we must have a diverse board of directors because it is a business imperative. 20 years ago, people would have said, we should do it to provide people with an equal opportunity. 30 years ago, people would say, we have to do it because we've been sued. <laughs> and then most recently, people would say, well, let's do it because it's, it's a nice thing to do, right? It's a nice thing to do. Have. But today, the corporations who are looking at the different consumer base of America are saying, we need to do this if we're going to survive. Let me give you an example. Toyota. I'm on the diversity board of Toyota. So Toyota, which by the way is number one with Hispanics, African Americans, and Asians. Nobody knows that. There's a reason for that. Think about it. So Toyota said to us the other day, actually a year ago, we want to understand how our consumers in the United States, because the population has changed, and I think you all went over the population data earlier, you know, how it's changing is how it's going to change by 2050, all that. Toyota, which is always thinking ahead, right? They developed the first hybrid car long before anybody could pronounce the word hybrid. They lost money on it. Now they've got 13 models, and now they're working on fuel cells. They're way ahead of everybody else. Once again, they're saying, we're thinking of the future consumer of 2030 and 2040. It's going to be a very diverse consumer base. So we have to design our cars to take into account what that future consumer wants in a car. So they're asking, what do Hispanics like about cars? What do African Americans like about certain colors of cars? What do Asians think about the way a car is designed? Nobody else is doing that, I assure you. Nobody else is doing that. We spent a year on that, working with their engineers and their talent with a diverse group trying to help anticipate what the car of the future should look like so we can accommodate the changing consumer of the United States. It is a business imperative. They're not doing it to be nice. God bless Toyota. They're not doing it to be nice. They're doing it because they have to if they're going to compete against General Motors and Ford and everybody else and BMW and all the other what we call transplants. And I can give you example after example after example of how companies are now doing that. And why is it important to have diverse people on your team? Let's talk about Hispanics, for example. It's important to have Hispanics in, in administrations because Latinos understand that there are 55 million Latinos in the United States today, that Latinos are going to be 25, 30 percent of the population very soon. They also understand that Latinos are very young, that 35 percent of Hispanics today are under the age of 18. And they also understand something that most business people don't know. Which group is the most active user of social media and digital technology and cell phone use? Latinos, young Latinos. And there's data to prove this. And people are very surprised to hear it. 
I, apparently we like to talk a lot, <laughs> right? And share pictures and share stories and all that stuff. But why is that important? Everybody, all the companies are going to social media and digital technology and reaching your customer on your cell phone. So unless you understand that consumer, you're going to miss it. It's a business imperative. So understanding how you can provide products and services to your customers is important because you'll be successful, but it, br it brings brand loyalty. I can talk about African Americans and Asians, but let me talk about Hispanics. Hispanics are extremely loyal. Once they like a product, they will stick with it. Once they like a politician, they will stick with it. Once they like a particular company, they will stick with it. But do something wrong, mistreat them, trick them, and they're gone forever. I will not refer to the company here in Colorado who made that mistake 30 years ago in the state. Some of you are nodding your heads, you'll remember. Had a big battle <laughs> with the Latino community. Guess who's not drinking, I shouldn't say that, who's not using that product anymore? <laughs> and they have yet to recover after almost 30 years. So if you're an elected official or a city manager or you know, you're working in public works or whatever it is, if you don't understand your customer and you're not serving them because you don't understand their needs and their wants, you could do something wrong. And once you do the wrong thing, you've lost them. But once you do the right thing, they will be your partner forever. They will be you during thick and thin. So when you need to go have a bond issue to build a new school, you can count on their support. When you need to do whatever it is to move the city in a different direction, by sitting down with them, they will, there's a, an element of trust there that they can rely on and follow you in some sense. So that's another reason it's important. Um, what can local government managers do to help improve diversity? I think I've established the reason for having it. It's a business imperative. It's a customer imperative. You can mentor students. You probably talked about this during your session, so I hope I'm not repeating that too much. Internships for college students. What about succession planning of yourself? Are you thinking about who's going to replace you? Mr. City Manager? <laughs> succession planning. We don't think about it. We don't think about, well, who's going to replace me? Am I training somebody to replace me in five or 10 years? We all should be doing that, by the way, not just ethnic minority city managers or whatever. Succession planning is very important. Being a champion for a fellow employee. I've learned that in big companies like Toyota, unless you have a champion, you get lost in the bureaucracy. So be a champion for people. Be a role model yourself so that others will follow. You were very graceful, gracious this afternoon in, in saying that you're very proud of me, and I appreciate that. And there's a flip side of that, though. There's a flip side of that. And that is, if you don't do the wrong thing, if you don't do the right thing, and you make a mistake, and you're in a position of public trust, and people are looking up to you for good things, and you fail, that reflects on the broader community. Worse, if you do something that's inappropriate, in whatever fashion it is, there are some people who will say, you know what, I thought they were like that. <laughs> and you reinforce the stereotype and you set back the cause of others who are ready to serve, who could serve properly because of your misconduct. So there's a dual side. There's a responsibility, there's an opportunity, but there's also the potential that you can make a mistake. And mistakes are made, but I'm talking about egregious conduct, which is unbecoming of any citizen or any human being. Those are the things we have to be very careful about. What can employees do? You can advance your own knowledge, your own credentials. I'm looking at Olivia here. She's a, I hope you, Olivia spoke earlier. I'm not going to pick on her because I just love her to death. But she was a director of a, two nonprofits in Denver. I was very supportive of her. She worked hard. She's educated herself. She's done all the things. She traveled all over the state. And what happened? Governor Hickenlooper said, I want her. <laughs> so the governor stole her from us. And she's doing a great job there. But she's done it. She's done the hard work. And each of us have to do the same, the, the same hard work to elevate our professionalism so we can do better things, whether it's mentoring students, speaking at high schools, 
affinity groups. Do you have affinity groups here in Adams County? Do you affinity groups are groups of ethnic and racial and women. So major corporations now have groups of Latinos and African Americans and Asians and women, and they all meet and they talk about their issues. You don't have those? Well, you might want to think about that. In Toyota, we have them, and I meet with them. I travel around the country, and I meet with the affinity groups, and I hear a lot from them. I learn from them firsthand what they're thinking about the people upstairs. And then I go back to the board meeting and say, well, wait a minute. I heard something from our people in you know, a certain state that things are not going as well as you think they are. And they feel they're not being promoted or they're not being listened to. So the power of affinity groups is very, very helpful in order to advance diversity and to help people who are perhaps in lower positions in, in, a, in, a, in a bureaucracy to feel that somebody's listening to them and, and the expectation and hope that they can be promoted someday and they can be advanced. And you do that by listening to them and saying, hey, I want your ideas on how to design the new car of the, of the year 2016. I don't want you to just do your job. I want you to do more. Help me build this company. Help me find more customers. Help us be more economically, financially successful. Those are the smart corporations that approach their employees like that. Preparing for the future, you know what that's all about. And perhaps the most important topic, Linda, you asked me, and, and Manuel, you said, why don't people talk about this? Why is it an uncomfortable subject? It's uncomfortable for obvious reasons. Number one, we're all human. I'm human. I'm sometimes nervous when I see somebody that comes from a different background that I don't know and I don't know much about. I may have some stereotypes about that person. Who knows? We're all like that. So what do we do? We hang around with the people we know who are like us, right? We go to church with them, social clubs. They're the ones who come to our card parties or whatever it is, or football games. We're more comfortable with people that look like us and have our similar backgrounds. And that's normal. That's natural. But there's also a sense of fear. There are some people who fear the changing nature, the changing complexion of America who look at the trends, the data you talked about today, and say, oh, this country is changing. I'm losing my country. You've heard these expressions. It's pure fear, which comes out of lack of knowledge. But a quote that I wanted to read you, it's the only quote that I have. And this is the quote. We're seeing an enormous influx of foreigners unacquainted with our language and customs. And the majority of these unfortunates <laughs> came here without money, without skill, as workmen. And they are turning into a, quote, new undesirable underclass. Those words were spoken in 1892 by the head, the superintendent of immigration of the United States. He was seeing Irish Americans and Italians and Eastern Europeans, many of whom did not speak English. They were poor. They were soiled. They didn't have the best educations. They lived in one part of their communities in New York or Chicago or Boston. They weren't assimilating very much. And that's what they were saying about those immigrants over 100 years ago. Thankfully, they didn't listen to that superintendent. They went off and became CEOs of companies, presidents of the United States, governors, successful philanthropists, people of America. They've built this country. They fought wars. They've made the United States who it is today. And I say to you, the immigrants are to, of today will do the very same thing in 50 to 60 or 70 years. We have the same fear of the immigrants of today that we had over 100 years ago. In some way, we haven't learned the lessons of the past. In some ways, which is sad, but maybe that's why we should learn more history about our country, so we don't repeat the mistakes of the past. A study was done by the Rand Corporation over 10 years ago in, in Los Angeles. Rand Corporation, you know, is one of the scientific think tanks. They studied a Mexican-American family in Los Angeles for three generations. And they concluded that after three generations, the Mexican-American family had advanced more economically, advanced more educationally, advanced more socially than did the first wave of European immigrants over 100 years ago, who did not assimilate as quickly and advance as quickly after three generations. Look it up. Rand Corporation study of a Mexican-American family in Los Angeles. So we have empirical data. And we also have common sense. When I drive around the metro area, I'm always impressed when I see a crew 
of people working on the lawns, and it's the Chavez company. Where did they come from? Or you'll see a, you know, the Gomez Gravel Company, or all these new companies, or restaurants, or small stores. And why is that? Because studies now show that Hispanics in particular are more entrepreneurial than any other group in America. Evidence, look at the Hispanic Chambers of Commerce in the United States, which have grown at a rate much faster than the other Chamber of Commerces in the United States. And if you look at the extent of entrepreneurship among immigrant Hispanics, it is far higher than any other immigrant group. Next time you're driving around, just pay attention. Look at who is doing the roofs. It's not just roofers working for another company. And many times, it's a Hispanic company that now owns a roofing company or the yard company or whatever it is. They're entrepreneurs. They want to succeed. They've come to this country, and they're going to contribute. They already are. So let us learn from the past and understand that diversity is something we should not fear. We should understand. Now let me talk personally about this just to end this conversation, and then I want to answer your questions. So when I first ran for mayor, and my good friends, <laughs> I'll tell you two stories about that. My good friends said you shouldn't run. Denver's not ready for a Hispanic mayor. But then I had fellow Latinos who said, you're not going to win, so I'm not going to waste my vote on you. It's very logical. I mean, actually, it's very smart, right? They, they were proud of their vote. So I'm not going to waste my vote on you. So in my primary election, I did not get a large Hispanic vote. That may surprise some of you. A lot of Hispanics voted for Mary McNichols because they had known her for a long time. But once I won the primary and I came in first instead of six, which is what some of the newspapers thought I was going to do, Hispanics all of a sudden, my lord, this kid could possibly win. And then they all intellectually made a decision, we're going to support a winner. So they all switched over <laughs> and <laughs> helped me win in the runoff election by 6,000 votes. But what happened to the rest of the people? who were not Hispanic. Why did they support me? What did I do? I went to every neighborhood meeting I could find. I would walk into Balloonists, a club of Balloonists at the Capitol Hill Neighborhood Association in near, near Cheeseman Park or someplace. And I'd walk in and say, hi, I'm Federico Pena. I'm running for mayor. And they go, what? Who are you? But then I would speak for 10 or 15 minutes, and they'd say, you know, this kid has some interesting ideas. He actually is pretty articulate. He's pretty smart. He's got a vision. He wants to be mayor. Maybe we should listen to him. They weren't convinced. But let's keep an open mind. And I did that time and time and time again. I stepped out of, quote, the comfort zone. And I went and talked to people everywhere, every church, every group, from every walk of life. Because remember, back then, in 1983, Denver was only 18% Hispanic. And in terms of registered voters, the registered voters, only 9% of the registered voters were Hispanic. So I couldn't run a quote as Hispanic mayor. <laughs> I had to get everybody's vote. My point is this. We all have the same opportunity. And in this time of immigration reform, in this time when the, demography, the demographics of the country are changing so much, in this time when there's so much fear, we have to, quote, I don't, I don't use the word expose ourselves, we have to meet Wrong word. We have to meet other people, get them to know you. So they'll know that, oh, Rosa's a nice lady. She's very smart, and she's well-educated, and she's much different than I thought she was going to be. And having that personal interaction, having people get to know you and one another, it's vice versa, by the way, is the way in which we continue to appreciate the value of diversity and that every per person counts. And that in this nation, if you work hard, if you believe in yourself, if you get a good education, and you don't give up, and you pick yourself up when you fall down, you will do well, you will contribute, you will make America greater. And that's what all of us have to do as local officials, to embrace that diversity because it's an imperative, to understand how it will make you more effective in reaching out to your customers, how it will build bonds with your customers in a way that will pay off for years and years, and because it will help them become better Americans, more successful Americans, and make this country even better than it is today 
so that 50 years from now, we won't be reading any more quotes from superintendents of immigration saying things about immigrants or people of different ethnic and racial backgrounds. If we all do that, I'm absolutely confident we will have a great, great future. Thank you all very much. I appreciate it. Oops. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.